Hi everyone, welcome to series one of Asian Women Breaking the Norm, the one of its kind purpose driven podcast inspiring Asian women to reach for their dreams. I want to thank each one of you for being here again, listening, learning and growing. So the topic of our discussion today is more about breaking a stigma surrounding divorce in Asian families. Now, now not many women can actually divorce without the hell breaking loose for them. No matter how independent you are, how educated you are, there is still a stigma attached to divorce in Asian culture. Now, by no means am I saying that divorce should become so easy that marriage in itself should become a mere joke. All I'm saying is that divorce should not be so hard that it forces a woman to stay in an unhappy marriage for the rest of her life. I have seen many women living unhappily as they have been told throughout their life that it's better to live in a compromise than to divorce and start afresh. Stressful marriages actually lead to bad health, both physical and mental. It also sometimes leads to suicides. So to talk about the stigma of divorce, we have a really brave guest today who is happy to talk us through her experience of divorce and learnings that she has had during the process. Now, Mariam is the founder of Style Moguls, an image consulting company, and she has started the International Women's Society in Dubai with over 700 members. She's an expert makeup artist, artist and fashion writer, trained at the London College of Fashion and Chelsea School of Art. So Mariam, I will let you add to the brief introduction I've just given about you, because I know there are so many more feathers to your hat. So please give us a background of why you do what you do and welcome to the show. Um, well, firstly, thank you, Ritika, for having me on the show and lovely to see you again. There are many things, but I do have a, a background in education and when I changed my career into fashion. So I do have a very traditional based um, career in teaching and uh, I went into education. So, yeah, that's my background. But other than that, yeah, very creative and, uh, uh, and uh, very adventurous in my career. Brilliant. So tell us about what attracted you towards doing style and, you know, you know, putting together style moguls as a company, as an image consulting company. What was your passion behind that? Whatever I've done, it's always been quite creative, quite colorful. I'm, I'm quite expressive, quite um, uh, flamboyant in every sense. And so it actually happened that when my father passed away, I thought, I've never really thought about my life so seriously. And I thought, well, I don't want to regret anything. And I, I know that I love interior design. I wanted to go to New York School of Art and Design and I couldn't because my parents were ill. So being a dutiful daughter, I didn't. But when he passed away, I thought, okay, you know what? Pack our bags, we're gonna go to the capital and I'm gonna study fashion. But that's what instigated it. I just didn't want to have any regrets in life. And I studied at London College of Fashion. Um, and the fact that I, where I studied is where I started teaching makeup as well. And I just loved the fact that I can change somebody's perception and make them feel and look good, uh, which was, you know, and it just happened to, to go that way. I had two parts, either interior decoration, design or, or, or styling. And, you know, sometimes you just meet people and it just gravitated towards, you know, styling, which I loved. So, and then, you know, started my image consultancy. So the first for the South Asian community, because I went to so many award ceremonies and I was like, so well educated and experienced and accomplished but why don't they look the part and you know how image is so everything in in PR and when you're um, creating a business because you know if somebody that sorry doesn't look good to me and is not uh, well presented I would never do business with them because if they can't take care of themselves how can I do business with them Absolutely. so my whole premise was um to really change that perception of someone and firstly about your styles and how people can react to you. So that, that for me was very interesting, the psychology behind it. Absolutely. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> and different people say different things about image and your looks. Yeah. Some people see through, you want to see through, but yes, the first thing that me meets the eye is how you look. So I, I agree with you there, but let's talk about time scales. Like when did you do that? Was it just after college? Was it, and when, you know, because you're going to talk about marriage and, and your, your, you know, yeah. on the journey of divorce. So how, how did that happen in sequence? So let's talk about so, that. So I wanted to tell your audience, there's no kind of secret formula to anything and whatever you do or whatever you choose to do. So you, if you decide to have a family first and then build your career, then do your business, it's completely up to you. I, um, 
I changed my careers quite late, like in my, my early 30s. So I retrained. So if anybody's thinking, oh, I can't do something or what am I going to do? I really want to do something, but you know, it's time and effort. I'd rather you spend the two or three years doing what you want to do now than spending like the next 10 years regretting that time that you could have done because it's too late. Life's, life's once and you've got to kind of really, uh, you know, accomplish anything that you want and you can. Oh my God, Mariam, you've opened a can of worms here. Not that, <laughs> not that I want to just go into detail on this, but this is absolutely so true. And I come across yeah. so many uh, clients who say, oh, but I, I am, I've studied architectural, say, for example, uh, and I don't want to, I don't feel a part of it. But, you know, I can't change my career now because this, 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 and, you know, so many years spent on it. Uh, but yeah, so you, d- you did your um, degree and then you became, you whatever businesses that you started, were they all yeah. simultaneous along with, you know, how when so, you married? Yeah. So I started, I studied IT and management. I'm an IT management graduate. Mm-hmm. The only reason I didn't go into kind of IT as in looking at the screen 24 seven, because and I'm very much a flamboyant, I'm a social person. I wanted to be out there, not stuck in front of a screen. So I chose to work for, uh, you know, uh, government bodies like Race Quality Council or the government or county councils. So I've always worked with them kind of evaluating software or designing inclusion projects. So something always based on education. And then I went into teaching. I worked for the prison uh, service. And you do think, you know, I'm the youngest uh, Muslim female to work in the Southwest prison service. And having a role like that, you know, is like, why would you want to work there? It's because it's, for me, it's teaching. They're my students. So... For me, I like to do something different. I don't want to do something the same like everybody else has done and challenge myself. And that's the main thing. As a person evolves and they get to discover who they are and who they want to be, I think that's how your choices are dictated. And some take uh, chances and they act upon them and some don't. So it's really entirely up to you. And sometimes you have circumstances in life, like my father's death life-changing moment where I thought, I don't want to be here. Like just pack up our bags and go. So yeah, that was a big, then life, big life changes are usually, again, they're the instigators of change. So you had a whole life here in London, you know, you worked yeah. here, you worked as a teacher, you had a whole career going, and then you got married and you went to Dubai, right? Yeah. So how did that change feel in your life? Um, I, I had no uh, ambition to leave London or leave my family and friends, was very successful in what I was doing. I went for a photo shoot, got stuck out there and just happened, you know, long story short, met my future husband at that time and embraced it. And I, I at that time, uh, liked our conversation and the qualities in that person, uh, embraced the UAE as thinking that it's such a beautiful East and West mix of culture. And why not? You know, if someone is meant for you and I connected with this person, you know, uh, to my core. And I thought, well, we have similarities. I feel like this is the right person. And, um, you know, and it just happened that I I took that chance, even though a friend of mine, when I was getting married, she goes, you know, you have to make new friends. And it didn't bother me because for me, you know, it was a, a new chapter. It, like many, you know, like many people, I, I married a little bit late in my 30s. So, of course, I wanted to be ready and uh you know i wanted to kind of do it with my heart and not just marry for the sake of marriage i think a lot of people kind of just fall into marriage and just accept and compromise uh where i've never wanted to do that so i just embraced it fully full-heartedly with open arms i just thought okay great what an amazing new start for married life Absolutely. And you know what, as women, um, we are conditioned to uh, put ourselves behind and just be very flexible and move with the flow of water. And and that's what exactly you did. You kind of left everything that you had here with your career, your friends, your family, Mm. and you just didn't think twice because you probably, you know, you can define this as love or you can define this as a woman's quality of being so strong that she thinks that she can reestablish herself in a new place. I never doubted the fact that I would never make it successful in Dubai or if I want, and really I didn't want to be, I'd worked so much and so hard. And I just thought that I was embracing this new chapter of marriage and I really welcomed the new chapter. So for me, you know, um, I think whenever you're doing something for me, it's a hundred percent. So if I'm going to do something, I really want to put my whole heart into it. I never do something that is just, you know, mediocre. So really, if I'm going to do it and put my 100% in it. So I, I, I embraced marriage and the UAE and, you know, new family, new culture, and, you know, new everything, which I, I thought was quite exciting. 
absolutely and and you proved it you know you you know you you started international women society in dubai with over 700 members in a new place where you yeah. knew nobody knew nobody you know yeah. and i'm sure w- without anybody's support so you know Rita, my mother came my mother came from london and she said Rita, what are you doing and i was like what do you mean she goes you know this international women's day is one of your favorite days of the year you're always doing something come on let's do something and she said to me you know, and, so, and sometimes you need people like that in your life. Like you need one supporter, you need one someone to push you and just say, come on, let's do something. And so I literally uh, had within a week organized a little event, posted on the internet. And uh, we had, I think 17 or 16 ladies that came to the first event in Marina, beautiful. And that slowly, gradually, you know, built up momentum. And every week I would do, uh, you know, See You Saturday, International Women's Society, because we were all like expats there. I didn't know anybody. And I thought, well, what a great pay- way to kind of A, connect with people, get to know their cultures and really uh, understand the culture of the UAE. You know, for me, I came with my, you know, British glasses, my Western attitude. And, you know, I re- really didn't know much myself. And it was a learning experience for myself. So, the ladies made it much more enjoyable. We'd have conversations. We got we got to know so much about each other, and just a really great support network. Absolutely. So, so you were married now to the to the man you thought you know you yeah. had clarities with. You had this you know absolute network of women around you. So, when was it that you started to realize those little taps on your shoulder that made you realize that perhaps you're not as happy as you thought you would be? Well, sometimes these things happen in silence they they happen so silently uh and so kind of quietly that you don't really uh notice them and there's such small increments that uh you know if you if you have uh big arguments and big you know uh clashes and you think okay there's there's something wrong so it, it was fine in the beginning but i think ultimately you have to create an understanding of of two cultures and two families coming together. And for me, I do believe that for me, that that initial, and it's always been, it was always there, but I probably didn't notice it because I just, I never regarded it as a problem. I thought, I'm so great. Why wouldn't you like me? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was like, well, I'm so wonderful. Like I'm gonna prove how, how great I am. And, you know, so for me, it wasn't even like that. And I just, I don't think I was ever accepted by the family that I was always an alien. I was always an outsider and I couldn't break into that cocoon of a family. No matter how nice I would be, I could be the perfect wife or the perfect daughter-in-law or the perfect, you know, like the perfect sister-in-law. I would never, I was never in that inner circle. I could never fit in. And then you're, you know, you have to have your partner, husband also kind of wanting to support you. And so that was, it started gradually dying down. And I thought, well, they, they, you know, am I going mad on certain things or am I, I'm saying things and they're just, you know, what, like what is going on? I needed that support. And especially being there on your own, like not having any family, no friends, you started to kind of doubt yourself. I, I doubted myself and I was like, what's wrong? What, like I couldn't put my finger on it, but because I've never kind of suffered like, you know, abuse in that sense, you know, no, nothing kind of dramatic, you know, our families are kind of educated, well settled, and we've never had, we've all loving families. So I never kind of thought about what I was going through. And then it just got worse and worse. And, it, and I think for me, trust is the most important part of a relationship. And there were so many things that came up time and time again, that I had to question. And I thought, like, literally I kind of got ghosted my own marriage you know I got kind of like every single terminology that you could think about I I've kind of gone through in my seven years and I I couldn't I was just had disbelief but because I'm such a you know um come from the mindset of Anthony Robbins and nothing is impossible like I would never give up on a marriage right so I for me that mindset was we'll work through this we can do this we'll we'll get through this so you know any challenge that i go through i always think okay let's how do we approach this how do we manage to get through this um and so it just it just became more and more difficult and i just want to just pinpoint to the listeners here is that it might not sound that bad and if you haven't gone gone through an experience like this you probably will still not understand what's coming out of what mariam is saying is because i i work alongside uh, some divorce lawyers 
right? And I know that when clients come to them, uh, come to a divorce lawyer for consultation or advice, the first thing that's being asked even today is that, was there any physical abuse? You know, did they, uh, or was there an affair uh, on the part of your partner? And these these things are considered as, you know, uh, the the rightfully agreed ways of or reasons uh, of getting divorced, right? And if there's none, none of these happening, then, oh, maybe you should try and make it work. But the most terrifying problems in a marriage could be the silent violence, as you just yeah. described it, because you can't point a finger on it. Yeah, let me give you an example. Like, uh, I would say, oh, you know, I'm not accepted by the family. I go like go in every Friday and like, you know, it's a day off on Fridays over there, right? So it's a weekend, even though my husband, ex-husband would go to play cricket the whole day. And then I, I would be sitting with the family. And I was like, well, there's no point. No one really kind of talks or no one's really, you know, everybody's doing their own thing and I'm just there. So I would enter a room. I, would, I wouldn't even be greeted. I wouldn't even, someone would even not even say, salam alaikum. A greeting is not even there. And he would say, well, uh, you know, they don't do anything to you. And I was like, that's the whole point. They don't even acknowledge that I'm actually in the room, <laughs> you know? And that was more hurtful. I'd rather have someone having a dialogue, but it was just like, let's just ignore this person. Let's just ignore everything about her. I don't know if it was that they were threatened. I'm so down to earth. I kind of wanted to blend in in every part and every aspect of life. Communicate on their level, because obviously I knew and, and understood that what my background is and how my brought up is and my education and the experience I could, I didn't talk about that. I talked about cooking and life and dramas and, you know, just so I could, you know, have a, um, have some common ground to speak on and then we can talk about other things, but it just never, I never even really got to kind of first base, <laughs> you know, it was, it was really difficult. And, you know, how much can you keep on having to prove and, uh, you know, trying to fit in with someone, you know, and then saying, look, you know, this is just really weird, you know, years later, you know, still having to kind of demand respect. And I know, you know, I'm getting like, oh, respect is earned. I was like, well, I don't even do anything to disrespect in the first place. You know, it's not my choice. You married me into the family. So surely that's the difference. You know, I didn't choose to be here. You, you brought me here. I get it. But this is your family, yeah. your in-laws, right? So yeah. when we talk about uh, your husband, how much was he in support of you, your businesses or, you know, um, with, with yeah. his family, etc.? So, let's so we, we, will ha we both had very entrepreneurial minds, very creative, very expressive. I think we were very similar in that sense. And it was all promises and grandeur gestures in the beginning. And then when it came down to it, well, you know, you're a woman, you can't go out there and you can't do this and you can't do that. And maybe you should just work in a little school. And, you know, it was just like, and I was like, well, oh, no, I don't want to work in a school. It's not for me. And then I was like, well, maybe I should have worked in a school just to get out, you know, just to be like having some sanity. And it was just always one thing after another. And it was like, even if I wanted to do something, there was no support by anyone. There was no support from me. It was just totally ignored. Like promotion that I did for L'Occitane is a brand in Dubai, a big um, um, event at Dubai Mall. Not only did they choose me once, but then three years later, after my car accident and all these kind of other calamities that happened, I, they still chose me again. And I thought, well, okay, well, that's really, I was very honored to do that. And, uh, but there was no acknowledgement, no support, no one like, oh, well done, you know, you did a great job or fantastic. It so sounds like you weren't allowed to be you, like yes. we're always yeah. told that you should do yeah. this and you should do that. And, and having not, not being able to live as you are, like being yeah. you, how did that affect your health? What I would tell your audience is that you think that you're okay. And, you know, you can put a smile on your face, you can dress nicely, you can go out. But what happens internally to your body and your mind is detrimental. I, I literally started, my body started breaking down. Like I was getting ill all the time. Like the most awful migraines in the world. Like I don't even know what a migraine was. I hardly even got ill in England, Ritika. Like a, a common flu for a couple of days and that's it. Like I'm that type of person that had, and still am, abundance of energy and, you know, real, real kind of zest for life. And all of a sudden, like headaches, my stomach was like, lots was going on. But the ultimate was that I had a car accident where I had that James Bond moment. I don't know if you've seen in the movies where the car is literally, you know, you see a car coming towards you. And I just thought, oh God, I'm gone. That's it. I'm, I'm, I'm gone. And I opened my eyes and I thought, shit, I'm alive. <laughs> I'm 
I'm still here. I was like, oh my God, I'm alive. And I, and I just, I thought, oh my gosh. And it, and it was a head on collision with the big massive Jeep and which was, that was speeding the young Arab guy. And all I remember when I kind of woke up is the guy just shouting at me and I couldn't remember. I didn't, I just went straight to the hospital and that was it. It was, it was awful. And that was kind of my wake up call that I got to do something. And I tried, I, and I'd got, I went back and forth. I yo-yoed from London and Dubai, London and Dubai. And in this, that, that took a couple of years. I, I literally went back to London and I came back again, and came back and, you know, I was really not settled at all. I, I, remember, I um, remember when I met you first, that was at a public Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, um, I was on that, yeah. I had come back from Dubai, yeah. You were here. And nobody could tell at the first at the first instance. Externally, you can't tell anything, can you? It's only after a few meetings that we that I discovered that you were going through. You weren't going through divorce at that point, but I think you were going yeah. through separation where you took time. You took that brave yes. step to say, "Okay, I'm not going to be here. I want to go back to my home home city, and I yeah. want to take some time to think." Right, and it takes a lot of courage to do that as well. So what was that one thing that kind of, was it right after the accident that you decided that, okay, fine, I'm going to go back and take some care of Oh, myself? no. Oh, oh no. It, 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 it still takes many years after that. You know, you still take that. I think even though you know, I think also you're kind of afraid. And I think the fear is the main thing. You know, you're afraid of like, like afraid and then kind of a bit of embarrassed. Let me make it work. I've put, invested so many years. Like, how can this possibly be? Like, I'm in, so in love with this person. I'm so nice to them. I can, like, I will do everything for this person. So why aren't they acknowledging me? Why, like, why can't they see? Why can't they see right in front of them what's going on? And um, it that took many years. It took many years. When I actually came back, I came back because again, re regarding health, it was because I had a cancer scare. Uh, I came back. I actually just came back for a holiday uh, to see my mother. Uh, went to the doctors, we just did routine kind of blood tests and stuff, found out that, you know, there was a cancer scare and that just, you know, that was, an, that was why I was here. Actually, that's when I met you, that I was going through that ordeal. So not only separated, having like a cancer scare and why? Because stress causes in a, such a, a over time, yeah. it, it causes your body to rot and it's venom inside your body. And I've never done that. I've never held on to something, but I didn't realize how much of that toxic behavior that I had swallowed. And it just, it just, it just got the better of me, you know? Absolutely. And that, that was the realization that I'm not looking after myself. I literally, I have prioritized everyone, everything for this one person to be in my life and I'm getting what, you know, what cancer? Marrying him was the easiest decision of my life because I was so happy and connected. I thought that this person was right for me, but leaving and making that decision was the hardest thing I've ever done. Hardest thing I've ever done. And, and it wasn't even my decision because I know I couldn't take it at the end. I actually, he had to do it. I yeah. couldn't do it. Yeah, I, I, I know I've been through that journey and it has been absolutely- Yeah, and thank you for your support. You know, you you happened to meet me at when, when you see, I'm always, a I'm always in the learning mindset. So I thought, let's go, let's go and study. Let's do something to build myself up. You know, I never want to be in that position where I'm, if I'm in that situation that I need to kind of move on and to do something else. I'm always in that creative process and that creative mode. And uh, when I met you, I was like, okay, you know, I want to meet different people. I have different conversations. And your brain actually stops working when you're constantly in fear, constantly in attack, uh, constantly being accused of things and having to defend yourself and all your energy goes into that you know instead of actually working on forward and your future you know I'm you know trying to save myself rather than actually building myself so when I came back I knew that I was back home let's start fresh and start building myself up to something new with or without him I was like okay let's do something let's do something positive for myself you know investing in yourself is the guy is the best thing, best you, can thing you can do. You yeah, yeah. get into fight and flight. I, I realize that. Yeah, but yeah. I also realize that talking to you and many of my other friends and um, clients going through similar experiences is that during your unhappy marriage, you get so many different taps on your shoulder saying, wake up, it's time for you to realize. But the dilemma that comes through um, is the fact that a woman would think, am I giving up too early? Do I yeah. need to 
slightly yeah. harder, right? Yeah. So there is no clear line where you can, no. which you can draw and say, okay, fine. If this happens, I know I'm walking out. It's based on your conditioning. It's based on what your parents have always been telling you that, you know what, beta, it's okay. We always, we as women should make all the compromises and it's all right. And there are very few people yeah. who will, in our cultures uh, tell us to say, okay, fine. You know what, you are unhappy. Clear your mind, write the pros and the cons and just, you know, make a clear decision. But you always yeah. fogged by other people's conditioning of, you know, being a girl and, oh, are you giving up? Is it that easy, you know, and all of that? And, you know, what's the guarantee? For example, yeah. some of my, my friends would say that the next person you will meet is going to be a better one. Or yeah. how will my old parents uh, take the shock of me divorcing, you know, at this age? I don't want to give them that stress. But yeah. trust me, staying and you can tell, 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 of course, firsthand is that staying in an unhappy marriage and being unwell doesn't serve your parents at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 I saw my mom withering away with worry. And every time I'd call her, she's like, what did he do now? Like, what, what's up now? Like, she would dread my call mm. uh, at a certain point. But, you know, again, like for me, it was isolation, having no one around. And I, I, for the circumstances were here that I was in London and I had friends and back and forth that behavior would never, that would never be acceptable because I was in a, a different country, but it is so much of a, a man's world. Uh, but, you know, I was, I was also learning. I, I actually thought, okay, this, you know, you can compromise. I'm not perfect. You know, we work at a marriage. We work at something that we want to achieve. So I'm always coming from that mindset until, and this is when good friends and good female friends support each other. A good friend of mine, uh, that I met at university, I told her what had happened and what, what I was going through because she she could see that this is not there could be Max like at university like this is not Max. Um, she said to me, "There's two things. There is sabr, which is patience, and then there is suffering. What you're doing is suffering, and even uh, Allah, God, doesn't say that one should suffer in life. What you're doing, what you're putting yourself through, is you're not honoring yourself." And I thought about it and I thought, I, I am actually, I'm disrespecting my father who brought me up so well with such great ethics and morals. And, you know, like I'm this courageous person. And even my mother said, you know, to him once that, you know, so what have you done to my Bahadur Beti? Like, you know, she's such a brave soul. What have you done? And when you have somebody chipping at you, like constantly, like, you know, you, you do break down, you break down. Um, and I think the stronger you are, the, the harder, harder it fall. hits. Yeah. yeah, the harder you fall. But also I would add, the stronger you'll come back. You know, you kind of learn. I felt like, you know what I felt like for many years? I felt like that, that movie Transformers. Like I would get a hit and I would fall. I would build myself up. And then I just, at that one point, I couldn't do it. At one point, I just thought, it's not worth it. And took some time out. <laughs> but me, being me, not giving up, Prithika... I went back twice to Dubai. I was like, oh, no, we'll work through it. Even though I, he said, oh, I've moved on and I've got somebody else. I was like, oh, right, so probably rebrand, blah, 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 blah. Let, let's work it out. I was that in love with that person. Persistent. Persistent. Just loved that person or wanted to know, like I wanted to build a life. And I, and I just thought we were, I just thought we were meant to be together. And maybe it was in my own mind that I had strong, such strong feelings for him. You know, I, I don't know. I can't explain any other way except for that it's just love. Yeah. It's just love, Absolutely. right? You just love somebody and you marry somebody because you want to be with them. That's it. They enhance your life. Absolutely. I Absolutely. I And I have seen you through that journey. And I know you have been, you know, through a lot of emotional, physical and financial problems. Yeah. But you now see a light at the end of the tunnel. And you've mentioned before that learning and growing yourself has, has been the one thing that has kept you going. So, you know, yeah. what's your future plans now? What are you planning to do with, with your ambitions, with being you? So, you know, a couple of years ago, I started uh, uh, this course podcasting. I saw Gary Vee saying it's the latest thing. And me, I'm always about trends and what's, what's the newest thing? What can I get my teeth stuck into? And it just resonated with me. So I retrained and did that. So I've been doing that for like, well, since 2000 and like 2018. And um, I love it. I love the conversations that we have. I love the fact that uh, conversations can change your, your, your mind, your direction, your life even. Um, as much as I love styling and changing people's perceptions, I think one conversation at a time can change the world. And so 
I, I recently now designed a program because I felt like I was silenced in those seven years. I don't think I was silenced, but I became quiet. And I think women should use their voices. And so I, I want them to use their voices like, like this, like we are on podcasts and really be vocal about their, their ambitions, their dreams. Why don't, why don't men ask them when they're getting married? Like, what, what do you want? Like, what do you dream of? Like, where do you want to be in life? Why do we always have to go along with them? What the man wants? Absolutely. So I want women, whatever they do, if it's cooking or sewing or a fashion, talk about your passion. You've got a voice, use it. Everybody's gifted with something. And I think when you discover that, then everything kind of falls into place. We're all evolving. So it's not like we're going to be doing this for the rest of our life. But whatever you're doing currently at this present moment in time should be something that you absolutely love. Because I think life is too short to do something that you, you know, you're half-hearted into, you know, like you don't enjoy. I think it's the worst thing ever in the world. And that's why I think entrepreneurship for me is the best thing ever. You know, I love my own creativity. I love to help others but don't want to be dictated by, you know, what I have to do and under a company and stand by my own truth. Absolutely. So what's the one thing that you would, you would have never realized about yourself if you stayed in that unhappy marriage? That I'm, um, I would say I've learned, I thought I was patient and I thought it was a good person. I think I've just developed myself to the, like the next level like my patience, my, my acceptance, my awareness about others and myself is just, is, is 10x. Like I can't explain it. I'm, I was, I'm very intuitive. I'm very much, uh, you know, a person that feels somebody's energy. And I just feel like it's, it's 10x. I feel like I'm so much aware uh, of my surroundings and how I am as a person, where I want to be, you know? I think it was the, like, again, it, I see it now as a blessing. It's probably one of the best things I did, move to a different country and meet such amazing people. Those are the great things I remember. Oh, that's brilliant. You know, as I wanted to bring out that not all divorces are bad and ugly. There is always something bright that comes out of it, a learning, say, for example, yeah. for yourself. Yeah. The strong. He taught me a lot. Ritika, he taught me a lot. He really, you know, and when I think when you, you get challenged by your partner, right? Like this is the closest person to you. And so when somebody says something to you, he's like, how dare you? Like, I don't accept that. Um, and when I would say that, he would obviously get defensive because he just didn't want to communicate. And you have to communicate and be articulate and how you want to argue, right? Like, you can't just, like, go off the handle. But I also think that, you know, when you're confronted with the, the closest person to you, which is your husband, then you, you, you have to face your fears. You have to face who you are, you know, and things that you, you have to internalize. Um, and, and, and we discover and think, actually, do I really do this? If he thinks that, like, you know, should I, how I, you know, and so it made me aware. A, it confirmed things and B, it made me eliminate a lot of things. So, so what, what is one advice that you would like to give to the listeners who are listening to this podcast because they are in a dilemma, they're in a state where they can't make a decision because they've been conditioned to live a life of compromise or they still, they, they still feel in love and they feel like they need to try harder like you did. So what's that yeah. one piece of advice that you would offer to those listeners? So for me, I always never give up, right? So the first thing I would say is for yourself, you know, have something that you like to do, you know, find a passion or a hobby or, you know, do some charity work, you know, go out and, and help someone else, serve someone else. Uh, that That is immediately going to fill you up. But also when you start having these conversations, um, it will you will discover more about yourself than you actually realize. You know, you have to interact with people in order to understand yourself. You can't just do it sitting and writing it on a piece of paper and thinking, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. This is how life should be. No, no, don't do that. You have to meet people. You have to have those interactions. You have to have and you know meet other women that will encourage you. But I guess where you start from is to you have to sit with yourself with with your thoughts. Um, and I always say, give yourself some time, separate yourself. If it's, if it's a situation, you know, that you can't handle, then I do believe a separation is good for you to discover what you feel about yourself without this person, you know, in a different environment, that's mostly important. And if you can't do that, then you have to, by increments and slowly communicate the fact that what I do 
uh, let's just say international society. What I do is with women, it's not offensive. It's not an Islamic, it's not harmful. There's nothing detrimental with religiously, socially, economically, physically, there's nothing wrong with doing it. So you have to find some way of slowly communicating how you're going to move forward and then kind of convey your dreams, convey your, and, and I think communication is key. You know, if you can't communicate with your, with your partner, your significant other, your husband, you're not going to get far. How will you, how will you, you can't, otherwise you'll be strangers living in the same house. Absolutely. And the communication starts with communicating with yourself with a little bit of me time, I guess. Somebody asked me, you know, what is it that you want, Mariam? What is it that you want? And I couldn't answer it, Ritika. I was so, I had such a brain fog. I was so clouded uh, in my brain of like, what is it that I want? I had actually, for, I had put everybody first for such a long time. I was always chasing and sorting things out between me and my, my ex-husband that I never allowed myself to say, what, what, are, what do you want? What do you like? What, what is it that you want to do? And so do that. Yeah. Find out what you like. <laughs> do a SWOT analysis. You know, find out your strengths and weaknesses. Find out and discover. Do I really still like these people? What do they enhance me in my life? Or are they... What value are they adding? Yeah. Yeah, I think start kind of doing... Do an audit. Do an audit of your life, you know, uh, of people and places and things and, and this you know? conversation was absolutely insightful i must say that a um, lot of things that um, many people will probably listen to this again and understand because there was really deep stuff in this uh, but thank you so much mariam i end my podcast with a small rapid fire round yeah. one line or one word um so yeah let's shoot off are you ready okay go for it what does style mean to you uh it, it um it's a feeling. It's a feeling. It's an energy. Thank you. Best advice you've ever received? Uh, follow your dreams. Supporting women gives me? Um, uh, immense joy. And give it a chance. I would love to. Um, have an interview with Oprah. <laughs> I, I would love that too <laughs> that was beautiful. yeah absolutely inspirational yeah I, I really she's one of my role models so I would say yeah given a chance I would definitely I'd like I'd love to meet her and, and interview her and find out like what makes great interviewing like what does she learn over the 25 years oh, so experience has taught you um experiences oh god like so many so many uh experiences what? taught me that um uh, don't judge people. Mm. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. So any last thoughts that you want to share before we wrap up the episode? Maria? I would suggest that anybody that is going through hardship or a challenge, you know, in that moment, you think that life is over. You think that how am I ever going to get out of this? You can't really see the light after the tunnel. You can't see anything. You don't know which direction you're going in. I would definitely say because I'm very much spiritual soul that, you know, so you, you need to also connect with your creator. You know, don't ask anybody for advice. Don't talk about your problems. Try to, you know, I, I, if I have a problem, I go down on my prayer mat and really like, and ask for, you know, our, you know, creator to, to help and, and, and allow you to go through this process see the blessing in it what is the reason what have I learned from it but really at that time you, you get stuck and you just think oh like you don't want to get out like you don't want to get out of bed you don't you, you don't want to do anything and then and then over a period of time time will heal and honestly you will look back, back at it and think oh my god you know is that what it was but it's such a it's a, such a learning for you but at that, at that moment in time you don't you don't see any hope you don't feel like to do anything so have good people around you even if it's one good friend or your mother or your you know father someone we need one person just that you can open your heart to and um and, and never give up you have so much to offer so much just you can do anything you want it's just a little face it's just a chapter ended and new chapters to begin 
Absolutely brilliant. I am so grateful for your time, Mariam. Um, you have been absolutely fabulous. I don't have to say that, but you've just completely been honest, upfront, and have added so much value to the listeners today. So I'm really, really grateful. I do look forward to speaking with you soon. <music>